So we'd love to know that you're here. Well, I'm Pastor Ben, and it's my privilege to share God's word with you this morning. But I want to do something this morning. I want you to travel with me into a a not-so-distant future. And I want you to imagine that uh, you're in a retirement home. Maybe at this point in time in your life, you're actually living in the retirement home. Or maybe you're just visiting the retirement home. But as you, as you look around, as you kind of see what's going on, you see an older lady. She's sitting in a rocking chair with a, a blanket over her to keep herself warm. And sitting at her feet are two young kids. They're socially distanced. They're six feet apart. They're six feet from her. And, and you're just curious about what's going on. It seems like she's telling stories. And so you make your way over there just close enough to, to hear. And you hear one of the little girls say, Grandma, can you tell us that story again about what school was like when, when you were our age, when you were a little girl? And Grandma, she's told this story hundreds of times by now, but she, she smiles and she says, Well, girls, when I was a little girl, I had to get up really early, put on my school clothes, uh, pack my book bag, put my books inside and all my homework inside, and then I would eat breakfast and I'd sneak out to the curb. And I'd go out there and I'd wait for the bus. And the bus is like a car with a lot of seats inside of it. It was, it was bright yellow and all the neighborhood kids would get inside this bus to ride to school. At this point in time, one of the grandkids, she, she raised her hand to get grandma's attention. Wait, grandma, are you saying, are you telling us that you actually sat right next to the neighborhood kids? And grandma says, yeah. Yeah. We crammed into that bus. There were so many kids. It was so much fun. It was so loud. And guess what, girls? We didn't have to wear face masks. And then after that, we would get in the bus and we'd go to school and and all the buses would line up. And all the neighborhood kids from all the different neighborhoods would get off the, all the kids from all the town, we would go into this big building that we called a school. And we all go inside, all the kids of the town, and we go into our classrooms. And we sit in our desks. And these desks were so close that when the teacher wasn't looking, I would write a note to my friend and I'd hand it to my friend next to me or have someone else pass that note around. And yeah, the teacher actually was in the classroom. She wasn't on a screen. It wasn't a computer or TV. Our teacher was actually in the classroom with us to watch us hand notes and to teach us. Now, I hope this is not the story that we're telling our grandkids someday. I hope this is not the story that we have to tell our kids someday. I hope it for my kids. I hope it for myself. But really, I hope it for our teachers because it must be incredibly challenging to continue to educate our kids on an online platform. When you're trying to take what what you know and to get them to think about that, right? Sharing it with them, helping them grasp those concepts and then releasing them into the world with that knowledge. Because that's what teaching is. And it was difficult before, but now it's got to be incredibly difficult. When you share what, what you know, you, you share it with them. So you work on it together and then you release them into the world. Because teaching is that simple. I shouldn't say it's simple, but that's the process, isn't it? I do, we do, you do. It's the same thing with coaching. Right? You have a skill set or you have a knowledge base. And I coach baseball in the area. And so that's what I do. I say, hey, this is what I know. This is how you do it. Now let's do it together. And we work on that skill and and I help them refine that skill and then I release them into the game, right? Now you do it, right? Find success on your own on the playing field. In a mentor relationship, we have the exact same thing, right? Maybe at work you've been assigned a mentor or maybe you've chosen a mentor, somebody who's had really good success in life and you say, can we just spend some time together? And this is the process. They say, well, this is what I've done. This is how I have found success. Let's do it together and work on it together to refine that process. And then you go out and you do that because that's the process. I do, we do, you do. And anytime we we mess with that process, anytime we take out a component or every time we might misorder that order, we run into some serious issues. In fact, when I was in college, I ran into this very dilemma. I was taking an accounting class, and I got to tell you, I'm a little nervous about sharing this story because now that we're online and broadcasting live, I have no idea who's all watching, and so I'm a little nervous that my old professor who taught me accounting is watching, and she's probably going to be really offended by this conversation. So if you're watching, I apologize up front, but this is my take on this experience. You see, what she would have us do is take our textbook, 
read the textbook, right? Read the chapter and then do the homework. And then we'd come back and she would grade the homework and then she would teach us how to do it. You see how that got out of order? And that became an issue for me because what happened was I would read the textbook, I would teach myself the way that I would do it or the way that I understood it. I would do the homework and either I got it right or wrong when we graded it, but then she would reteach me either the right way or her way versus my way. And it just got very, very, very confusing to the point that I, I moved all the way from an A in the class to an F in that class, and I promptly dropped that class and moved on to a different professor. Well, this summer, we're going to start a new sermon series called Unmasked. And in this sermon series, this is what we're going to do. We're not going to talk about wearing masks in, in Menards and things like that. We're going to talk about the ugly truth. If we unmasked the truth of how the world sees Christianity or how the world sees Christians specifically, what would they say? What do they say? And we're going to run into some ugly things along the way and we're going to feel some guilt along the way, but, but that's okay because we're also going to learn how to unmask the Holy Spirit that lives within us to change how the world sees us and ultimately to change how the world sees Christ. And if you missed out last week, we had a, a standalone sermon called Forged. We talked about how the Holy Spirit actually lives within us, temples within us. So we are the church. And so if you missed out on that, go back. You can listen to it and then you'll fully understand what I'm talking about. But as we work through this sermon series, we're going to actually use a, a theme verse a statement, a quote by Jesus while he walked on the face of the earth to tell his disciples how they would be known, how the world would see them. This is what he said. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So what did Jesus say? What should the world see when they, when we unmask the reality of of what they think about us? Well, Jesus said, everyone, the whole world, everyone in our town, everyone in our nation, everyone on the globe, they should recognize a believer in Christ. They should recognize a Christian by their love. Now, this is a challenging statement. It's a challenging statement because how do you define love? Is love a feeling? Like, I feel like I'm in love with you. Is love a statement we make? But hey, I I love you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Is love just letting somebody do whatever they want to do, like some sort of libertarian love? Or is love letting people do what they want to do unless it's going to cause damage to themselves and then we step in and we don't let them do that? Is is that love? Is love lying to somebody to make sure they don't get their feelings hurt? Or is love always telling the truth? You see how this can get challenging as we try to understand the statement from Christ? But remember, Christ is the master teacher, which means he is a master at his craft, which means he follows the I do, we do, you do model. And so we don't have to guess what he means when he says, the world will see you because of your love. We actually get to see it in his life. In fact, just before he made this statement, if we back up a number of verses just before, he actually showed the disciples what love was, an amazing testament to Christ's love. See, this is what we read. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. So as we step into this moment in history, we step into the middle of a festival, and when we hear this festival of Passover, we should get a picture of a, a lamb in our mind, because that's the picture that these Jewish people had in their mind when they were experiencing this. Because what they were celebrating is how a lamb protected them. Specifically, a lamb was killed, the blood was spread on the doorposts, and that protected their firstborn. And they celebrated that God used the blood of a lamb to protect them. In the same way as Christians, as we move forward in history, we celebrate the Passover lamb. But not a a little lamb. We We celebrate the perfect Passover lamb, which is Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to protect us from our own infirmities, our own sins, right? So we can have an eternal relationship with him. But that moment hadn't happened yet. When we, when we step into this moment in history, Jesus hadn't died yet. However, he did know it was coming. He knew all the things that were coming. He knew he'd be betrayed. He knew he'd be denied. 
He knew that he was going to go through intense agony all the way to death. He knew these things were coming, which is what makes the story so amazing. Because in the midst of all of this knowledge, this is what we see in his life. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So there's our word, right? Love. Jesus, who knew everything that was going to happen to him, knew all the pain that he would go through, knew all the people that would deny him and turn on him and walk away from him, knew that Judas would, would betray him and turn him over to the point that he would die, even though he knew all this, it says he loved them all the way until the end. It didn't say he said, hey, love others, or he said, I love you, and then mistreated people. It doesn't say he said, I love you, and, and, and then he would not acknowledge people. No, Christ lived out his life by living out love and then speaking of love. In fact, this is where we see it in an amazing way. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. See, like I said, Jesus knew everything that was coming. He knew everything that was going to happen. He knew Judas would betray him. He knew he'd be put on the cross because of Jesus' actions. He knew this, but he loved him anyways. And this is why this next part is so amazing, because this is what he does for Judas. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin. So we find the disciples, and they're celebrating the Passover supper, right? They're having a great time together. And all of a sudden, Jesus just gets up and disrupts the supper, right? He just stands up. Now, my wife tells me that this is very, very rude because I fall into this trap as well. Sometimes in the middle of a lunch or a supper, I, I get thinking about all the stuff that I need to do, right? All the things on my task list, and I get really, really antsy. And, and if I can't stop myself, I stand up and I just start doing stuff. I might clean some plates or put some stuff away, just trying to speed the process up. But there's a problem, right? When I do this, I disrupt the dinner. And guess what my kids do? When my kids see me behave this way, then they start getting antsy. They have other things they want to do, especially if they're done eating, and they want to get up and, and move around, and, and it just creates a whole mess. And so this is kind of a, a rude thing, but Jesus, he steps up because there's something to do. And we know there's something to do because what does he do? He says he, he removes his outer robe, which means he's going to go to work, right? This was a sign that he's going to do some manual labor. Then he wraps the towel around his waist, and then he fills up this basin with water. And as he's doing this, as he disrupts the meal, all disciples are watching him. And as they're watching him go through all these steps, they begin to realize what he's about to do. And everything in their being is saying, no, there's no way that this is happening. There's no way that this is what it looks like. But that's exactly what happened. This is what Jesus did. And he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around his waist. You see, we don't really get this as Americans. I mean, feet are kind of gross and we don't really want to wash someone's feet. I mean, we kind of get that. But we don't understand the depth of this moment. You see, the reason that everything in the being of the disciples was, was screaming no is because they wouldn't even wash Christ's feet. That was far below them, right? That was despicable to them. Even though he was their Lord and master, they would have never done this, even though they were much lower on the totem pole. You see, in that culture, even the Jewish slaves wouldn't wash somebody's feet. That was too far below even a Jewish slave. The only people that were allowed to wash somebody's feet were Gentile slaves. So who's a Gentile slave? Well, a Gentile slave is somebody who either owed someone so much money that they actually stepped into slavery to pay off that debt, or there was someone who they went to war with the nation of Israel. Israel ends up winning, right? The Jewish people end up, up winning. And then instead of being killed, they say, whoa, 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 don't kill me, don't kill me. I'll be your slave. 
right? They gave their life as, as a ransom and they'd step into this space. Those were the only people that were allowed to wash feet. And so when Jesus takes off his outer robe, wraps the t- their feet, they had never seen anything like this. They had never seen anybody lower themselves voluntarily to this stature. And everything in their being said, this is not normal, this is not good, we don't like this. In fact, Simon Peter would voice this. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. So when Jesus comes to Simon Peter, he says, look, I'm going to teach this to you. You're not going to understand it. I I know everything in your being says no, but I'm really, this is a teachable moment. I'm going to tell you something. I'm teaching you something through this moment. But despite that, what does Peter say? No. Right? He says, whoa, whoa, Jesus, you're not going to behave this way. I'm not going to let you behave this way because this makes me uncomfortable. It's abnormal. We've never done this before. Right? Peter says, no, Jesus. And what happens? Peter unintentionally gets in the way of what God is doing in this moment. But Jesus isn't going to let Peter's woe stop him. This is what he does. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. So Jesus goes on to continue to teach, right? He loves Peter. He doesn't want him to get caught in this, in this woe mentality. He says, look, understand this, Peter. Understand this. There's something special happening here. There's something I want to share with you here. And when Peter grasps that, when Peter understands that, his woe turns to, wow. God, I know I'm uncomfortable I know I don't like this. I know we've never done it this way before. But God, I'm I'm ready to receive whatever you have to offer. In fact, if if washing my feet is going to bring something to me, then we might as well just get weird, Jesus. Just just wash everything, right? Wash everything. If if that little bit is going to help me, then let's just do the whole thing, right? Take me as far as you want to go. I'm not worried about being uncomfortable. I'm not worried about any of that, Lord. Just lead me where you want to go. Wow, God, What are you going to do? Well, this is what happens next. And Jesus says, And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. Once again, this is what's so amazing about this moment. Jesus knows what's coming. Jesus knows that Peter, who he's washing his feet, is going to deny him. And he's going to say, no, I don't know him. No, I I don't know this man. I don't know this man. He also knows that Judas will betray him. He knows that it'll be Judas' actions that actually set up the stage to put him on the cross and to allow him to go through all that pain and suffering. He knows this. But whose feet is he washing? He's washing the feet of Peter. And he's washing the feet of Judas. Jesus is perfect He didn't do anything to turn Peter against him. He didn't do anything to turn Judas against him. Right? He is perfect. He has done nothing wrong to create any animosity in that relationship. But even though they're going to turn on him, he washes their feet. That's a powerful truth to us as people, isn't it? It's a powerful truth to us as as followers of Christ. The reality is we're imperfect, which means if we have relationships that are broken, we are always part to blame. Right? We always pour our sin into that relationship. We always are, are part of that disruption. Which means if people turn on us, talk bad about us, betray us, gossip behind our back, we are still called to love them. We are still called to serve them. Well, the story goes on. After he had washed their feet, he had put on his robe and had returned to the table. He said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. 
So Jesus, once again, is working through these teaching steps, right? I do, I, I wash your feet. Now he's in the we do part. Let's process this. Do you understand what I, I've done for you? Let's talk about this. Let's work through this. Let me, let me share my knowledge and my wisdom and my heart with you. And then he moves on to the next step. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. This is where he brings it home. He hands now this mission to them. You wash one another's feet. You show love in this way. And why are you going to do this? Because I'm your Lord and teacher. Remember how this started? I said, come follow me. I invite you into a discipleship relationship, which means the goal of that relationship is to become like the master. You watch the master live. You watch the master live life. The master does ministry, lives life with you, and then ultimately, you are the one who's left behind to live it out. That's what Jesus is saying. Hey, now I'm going to leave you behind to show love. I'm going to leave you behind because now you are the representation of me after I'm gone. And then this piece of history comes to a close. For I've set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. So what is love? Love is what you do. You see, far too often in our lives, when we ask people outside of the church about Christianity, and we pull back the mask, and we're really willing to listen to what people think and to hear the ugly truth, people say things like this. Well, Christians, they're all talk, right? Christians, they're just empty words, and that hits us hard, and we feel a little bit of a guilt, don't we? And the reason that we feel that is because it's true. Oftentimes, we're just talk. Oftentimes, we just use empty words. Oftentimes, we don't follow through. We say things like this. Hey, I'll pray for you. But then we don't pray for somebody, right? I'll, I'll donate to your organization. And then we never open up our pocketbook, right? Call me whenever you need me, and I'll be there to serve you. And then they call you on the phone, and you're a little bit conveniently busy, you see how this looks to people that were all talk and no follow through. But that's not what God has for us. You see, the beauty of this is that when we unmask the Holy Spirit, what we really find, if we can get out of the way of the Holy Spirit's work in our life, is that we don't find empty words. We find fruitful actions. Now, this doesn't mean that if we work really hard and we have fruitful actions, that that's what saves us. No, no, no. That's not the case. We don't have to do these things. We get to do these things, right? We get to let the Holy Spirit work through us and let our words match our deeds or let our deeds lead the way for our words. You see, right now the world sees us as, as people of empty words, people who talk a good talk but don't actually follow through. But what if we let the Holy Spirit work? What if we unmask the Holy Spirit within us and, and let him work through us. That would change the conversation. That would change the narrative. And we would hear things like this. Hey, I don't believe everything they believe. I mean, what they believe is kind of out there. I don't really buy into it. And, and that book they read, I'm not really into that. But man, they know how to love. Right? They are so sincere. Their words always match their actions. You see, if we learn to unmask the Holy Spirit, Christ's words will become true. They will know we are Christians by our love. Let's pray.